Ironhide Game Studios released their trailer for Kingdom Rush Alliance, revealing its release date to be the 25th of July. Most of Ironhide's trailers have come out with a much shorter distance from the release date, but this time things are different. Not just in terms of the trailer, but also the game itself. I have been lucky enough to get to beta test Ironhide's games since all the way back to the original release of Kingdom Rush Origins. As of this video, I am also a beta tester for Kingdom Rush Alliance, but we'll see if I lose everything after Ironhide sees this video. Just kidding, I actually went to Ironhide themselves and got approval to share the following information about my experience with Kingdom Rush Alliance. I intend to do so as accurately as I can within the limits of my loyalty to Ironhide. I really don't want to spoil anything that should be enjoyed by players themselves. I also really don't want to inhibit the hype for the game by letting the excitement of its actual content complete its lifespan before the game is even released. On the contrary, I want to generate as much hype as possible without spoiling Alliance. So, this is my attempt to be as specific as possible while still being totally vague about what's to come in the fifth installment of the Kingdom Rush series. First, I have to compliment the game's story. More so than any of the other Kingdom Rush games, I was genuinely interested in seeing what was going to happen next. Yes, I play video games for the plot too. Admittedly, I lost a lot of loyalty to the series lore with the release of Vengeance. That has nothing to do with the quality of the games themselves, it just happened to divide my own headcanons for things, so I stopped being as interested due to all of my theories unraveling, as those were carrying my interest for the most part. Here though, I feel like there's not so much lore to be found as there is just pure story. To make the distinction clear, I consider lore to be the background history of the elements of a setting. Stuff like where the Saurians came from, how the first barbarian tribe managed to survive in the mountains, etc. Story is the current events, what characters are thinking and doing, conflicts at hand, and events unfolding. I think this aspect is done quite well. You can see in the very opening comic, which is visible in footage from Ironhide's developer Q&A video, that the Lanerian captain makes a deal with Bezidon by shaking his hand. In the background, you can see some of the other Lanerian troops looking at the handshake with shock and trepidation. It would have been so easy to just let the Lanerians be convinced by Bezidon's opening speech and move on, because you just need to do the bare minimum to try to justify the game mechanics and the combat that will unfold in each level. But instead, they took the time to showcase how different characters have their own motivations and goals in the setting, and that difference is one of the things that can make stories more interesting. I was genuinely curious to see how trustworthy Vesnon turned out to be, and who had been making the better choices for the good of the world. That might seem like an overreaction to a minor background detail, but seeing as my options for highlighting the story's quality are so limited, I hope this can stand as an example for what the rest of the game will be like. There's lots to cover about gameplay, so let's start with the hero system. You are now able to play with two heroes at once, each getting their own hero spell. The second hero spell replaces the big spell that you would get in the other games, and that should be indicative of the balancing priorities in Alliance. As the games progressed in the franchise, heroes played an increasingly large role in the player's arsenal, while towers seemed to become less significant as a consequence. In Kingdom Rush 1, heroes started at level 1 and only had two abilities to gain over time, plus an innate trait for some of them. They also benefited from at most three star upgrades of that game. In Frontiers, they leveled up permanently and had five slots to fill with skills. They actually didn't benefit from star upgrades in that game, but it was telling that in the elite stages, the waves were balanced around you having a max level hero to help carry the early game, unlike in Kingdom Rush 1. Origins carried the Frontier system onward, while also introducing a hero spell to add to the player's arsenal, giving heroes even greater global presence. Fake fans will tell you that Vengeance gave heroes a passive ability, but I have two erm um, actuallys to respond to that with. First, erm um, actually, this isn't a passive ability. Passive abilities are things like toughness, which still take up a skill slot, but are always active rather than a skill with a cooldown. This is called an innate ability, because it will be available to the hero even without having to upgrade it. Second, erm um, actually, heroes have had innates since the very first game. The guarantee of an innate trait in Vengeance is hardly what makes heroes presence greater in that game. The real buff heroes got in that game was having an entire star upgrade tree dedicated to them while towers only got one star upgrade tree for themselves with about as many options as the other three trees. Reinforcements and soul impact had just as much going for them as the towers in Vengeance. However, in Alliance, there is no big spell for towers to compete with. In addition, each individual hero is about half as powerful as a hero in the old games. They have less health, less damage, longer cooldowns, and longer respawn times. As a result of these two balance changes, Heroes simultaneously make up the power of one hero, plus the one big spell that you got in the previous installments. 
This gives towers a lot more room to shine, and I think this is a good thing because it is a tower defense game after all. As for the quality of individual heroes, I am happy to say that they are pretty well designed. There are some pretty fun abilities to use here. To keep things not so vague, there is a hero named Niryu that can give themselves a buff around their body that deals damage to nearby enemies, who also has fast movement speed. This naturally creates a playstyle where, once the skill triggers, you want to move the hero around to damage as many enemies as possible with the buff, which gives the player a lot to do with their micromanagement that I only ever really experienced with Ruxa. There is also synergy between heroes with some skills. I won't go into detail, but some heroes can put effects on allies, including other heroes, which I think is really cool, because it leads to stacking playstyles and combinations that were never possible with a one hero system. A lot of hardcore fans have sung the praises of the first game's hero system because it rewards skill and gives the hero a less overwhelming role in the early waves relative to towers. I think that between all five games, fans of the first game's system will like Alliance's hero system second best. Because each hero is half as powerful as normal, it requires more careful usage of the heroes individually. They die more easily, making it more important to get the most out of their life. Without spoiling mechanics, heroes do get stronger as the stage goes on as well. So I expect this system to feel pretty good to people who want a more hardcore experience. The tower system is the same as Vengeance. Ironhide has publicly confirmed it themselves. This should come as no surprise to people, because it was the most obvious choice from a business perspective. While the Steam release of the game will have all towers and heroes available to the player for free, the mobile version will have some premium towers and heroes. The Vengeance Tower system is the best system for in-app purchases, so for Ironhide to make a decent profit out of the enormous effort they put into the game, this was all but guaranteed to happen. I still believe in the supremacy of the original trilogy system, but for what it is, the Tower system is fine. I would say that the number one flaw in the Vengeance Tower system is when it comes to balance. The player now has to factor in the opportunity cost of bringing a tower into the wheel compared to any other tower they could fill that slot with. While you did make opportunity cost judgments in the other games as well, this system makes them a lot more significant because you don't have every role that a tower can fulfill at your disposal. Instead, you have to think about which roles you need fulfilled and pick the towers that do that the best. As a result, the tower that fulfills your desired role best will become meta and consequently, when the player determines which roles they need filled the most often, it will lead to all other options being underused. This is my biggest concern with the towers at the moment. I would say that there are clear winners and clear losers for who gets picked on the team when going into a level. Maybe in time that will change, as Ironhide has shown their willingness and dedication towards rebalancing vengeance by a lot. So this is more of a concern than a real criticism of the game. It may even become a lot less skewed by the time the game releases, depending on the productivity of the beta testers and developers. I would also say that there is a significant gap in the fun factor of some towers. I really like using a good portion of the towers, and find the mechanics really fun to watch and take advantage of. Some towers have more than one unique trait going for them at once, which is a big step up for the entire rest of the franchise. But other towers are a lot more straightforward, and not necessarily in a fun way. Fun is of course subjective, but when towers boil down to dealing more single target damage with every one of their viable upgrades, it can feel somewhat stale to use them. That being said, with balanced tweaks I can easily see that being less severe. And like I said before, there is good fun to be had with a lot of the towers. Enough that you should always have fun in each level. Speaking of levels, I have to commend Alliance on having the best difficulty curve of any Ironhide game thus far. If you look at Kingdom Rush 1, the game peaks in difficulty at the beginning where it has irons and heroics that still might be the hardest levels in the entire series. Then the game continues to get easier as you unlock some of the best towers ever, like the Sorcerer and Tesla. Frontiers is the same way to an even more extreme degree. The desert stages are pretty hard, but things get increasingly trivial as you unlock more towers in the jungle until it reaches the apex with the battle mecha, which can solo the entire rest of the campaign. Origins was pretty good at having a nice difficulty curve, being the only game where you unlock the best towers immediately and then unlock all the ones that you don't want to use as much from then onwards, so you just execute the same general strategy with more and more micro involved as you go along. And then Vengeance starts out somewhat difficult until you unlock increasingly meta towers. Again. Alliance on the contrary has the best difficulty balance yet. What makes it better than even the balance in Origins in my opinion is that the heroics and irons are consistently tougher than the campaigns, but also shorter. So if you're looking for even more challenge throughout the early game, you can play those to get your fix but you can also play the next campaign stages to get more difficulty too. Also like Origins, 
It feels like every stage has a unique feature in it to make it stand out as more than just a series of enemies spawning, which I really appreciate. In terms of raw difficulty, I'd say this game does a good job at encouraging you to actually try with your tower usage. I will admit that I and some other beta testers did not struggle very much with the game on Veteran, but that should be expected given how much we play these games. If the game is beatable, then it's going to have some solution, and as strategists, you should be able to find that solution and not feel as much difficulty as a result. It's only when forcing a strategy to work and having to micro sweatily to make it happen that the games become consistently difficult. For Alliance's case, I am happy to say that this game is a lot more strategic than micro-intensive compared to the more recent Ironhead games, while still making micro useful. As you discover the winning strategy for a stage, it will still take effort to execute it, and that to me is indicative of an engaging experience. So the bottom line is that levels are fun to play. I will not comment on enemies and especially not on bosses. I think that the only things I have to say about them are going to be too spoilerific. So I will leave that for players to discover once the game comes out. If I could give a recommendation to anybody, it would be the following. Get the game on Steam. I know most people like to play the games on mobile because it's a convenient time killer, but there are a few things that make the Steam release outright better in my opinion. First, the mobile screen and controls are going to be inferior to a PC. They just will be. While I have my own critiques of the specific implementation of the mobile features, I believe that there's nothing Ironhide could do to make the mobile version better than a platform where you have hotkeys and adjustable resolution. Second, premium content. Alliance managed to capture the same formula for many, many updates like Vengeance does, and I believe that this time around, it will capitalize on that potential far better than its predecessor. As such, these updates will come with more heroes, more towers, and who knows what other premium content as well. The Steam version will automatically let the player have these things without having to make further in-app purchases. So if something new comes out that you would like even better than what you already paid money for, then you wouldn't have to spend more money to unlock it. This assumes that we don't get paid DLC like the Hammerhold update, and the optimist in me says that that won't happen. I think that DLC was an experiment for Ironhide, and I would speculate that they anticipate better sales for making heroes and towers individual purchases rather than a bundle attached to some levels. That's just my guess, but the point about premium content still stands for what currently exists in the game. As I said, the game is ripe with potential to make more and more content updates for an already really good campaign. I think that, if nothing else, the game should be on your radar as a potential purchase to make when you see enough things that you like about it. I would say that I can't wait for the release, but I actually welcome the extra time because I plan to finally make a video ranking all the towers from worst to best across the first three Kingdom Rush games, set to release a little bit before the 25th of July. I know that at the end of my video ranking video, I said that the video often felt like work to me, and treated that like a bad thing. But in the past three years, a lot has changed. To keep it simple, life is worth living. Life is worth working for. And it doesn't feel like work to me anymore anyways. Things get easier as you keep doing them, and I feel like I can put in the same amount of effort to get an even higher quality outcome this time around. To that end, I believe I am making honest creations with what I do, and that I'm not making myself do any of it out of obligation. I love nerding out by ranking things from worst to best, trying to find the best criterion to judge things by, and seeing how close I can get to solving something in a topic that I care about. I want this. And for anyone else who wants the same thing, make sure you smash that like button, subscribe for some epic gaming content, and hit the bell so you don't miss a beat from the Voodoo channel. Consume. Don't ask questions. Just consume product and then get excited for next product.